Welcome to Tanak Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobias Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A, coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi Toby, the man singer. Welcome back, sir. It's always a pleasure. And always, indeed, indeed. How are you today? Oh, great. It's a big, big pleasure to have me back. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, oh, of course it is. You enjoy my is. silly jokes. The rabbi with the most awesome hair in the world. That's true. The savior of the Jewish people. No, I'm just kidding. No, I would just say the leader. I couldn't go that far. <laughs> All right, just let you know your camera is flickering again. Uh, so if, my if, camera is flickering. Yeah, but don't worry about it. Just if it if it goes, I'll just I'll just put. No, up. no, it's not. It's um, my camera is flickering. Right now, it's fine. But it, when it flickers, it just flickers off for a few seconds, and it pops back. Uh, on, so. l- let me let me do something. Let me let me see if I could. Let okay. me let's fix this now, so we don't have this. You go right ahead. Sure. Well, while you means go right. While take, you do, you entertain them. I will entertain them with your website, Tovia Singer. Actually, one that uh, that we don't talk about a lot, Tovia Singer. TV. Just say nice things about me while I'm gone it'll take a moment oh i guess if I i'll find s- out later so don't try anything if i could spell that would probably help Tobia singer there it is right there Tobia singer okay well that one says that page isn't working let's go to outreach judaism then all right outreach judaism.org you guys know it right what you may not know though is one of you when you go there let me see if i make this big enough for you guys to see it, put it here, switch screens. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. So outreachjudaism.org. Uh, so many of you have his two-volume book set. Um, and it's amazing books. But what you don't know is these book sets were written off of these lectures. And if you go to the free audio tab here, you'll scroll down. You'll notice that um, all these titles here are the titles see, in the book. Um, and so if you, if, oh, yeah. whatever you're studying on, in, in his books, just click on the title of this, and you'll get separate information. It's not the same information. It's not an audio book. This is totally information that goes with the topic. So if you haven't done that yet, you're really, you're really missing out. You're shortchanging yourself. So there you go. Outreachism.org. All, right. All right. Looks there like we go. got you back, so that's good. Let me... There you go. Just make sure that all the viewers, make sure you put your cell phones on vibrate. There you go. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I no, it's, it's the host needs to do that. <laughs> you actually went for that. That's go funny. Ahead. Well, I was thinking about myself, and he was going, "How come I never thought of that?" Okay. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Well, again, right. so good to have you back, Rabbi. It's uh, it's always a pleasure. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have me back. I don't even know how you survive from week to week. I'm uh, telling you the truth. I don't. You, you you revive me every time we come back in here. I just, that's, that's right. how it works. <laughs> All right. Okay. But I'm back. I'm in charge. We're ready to go. You're rocking. All right. So let's go ahead and move forward with our first caller. Let me make sure I've got. Uh, I got a cord landing on top of my mouse. I can't use that that way. I got to shut this music down because it'll play through. You're the very call. you've. You're very, you know, you're very adept at this, and I have a feeling like in eight or nine years, you're going to have the whole thing. <laughs> eight or nine up. more years, yeah, for sure. We're yeah, actually on right. eight year now. That's funny. All right, right. appreciate your faith in me. It's always, <laughs> always, always a pleasure to, always a big pleasure to have. You know. Let's go ahead. All right, call you live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hey, Justin from Iowa, and my question has to do with. In the Gospels, Jesus mentions uh, the sin that cannot be forgiven, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And so my question is, is there an equivalent sin in Judaism where there's a sin that can't be forgiven? And kind of a second part to the question, um, is it possible that there might be, um, despite this, these verses, in, I believe it's Mark 3.22, Matthew 12.22, where this is uh, mentioned, um, if it's a later insertion after the doctrine of the Trinity was developed um, in order to support it and quell any you know, resistance. So I know that's kind of conjecture, but I've always wondered that. And, uh, yeah, that's just my question. So right thank you. Well, uh, Rabbi, are you, were you clear with those questions? Could you? Oh, yeah. Okay, can you just oh, reframe yeah. it for me? Thank you. Go ahead and hang them down to me for answer. Thank you. Yeah, just kind of because it sounded kind of airy on this side. It was kind of hard to hear some of it, so. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. So in the synoptic, uh, I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, but in the synoptic Gospels, in in Mark 3 and Luke 11 and 
Matthew 12. We have, it's Matthew chapter 12, verse 32, you're referring to. Um, we are told that if someone commit, Jesus says that if you commit blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, so then your sin is not forgiven. And his two-part question is, uh, number one, th that sounds Trinitarian, is the question. And the second part of the question was, is there any corresponding uh, sin that one could possibly commit in the Jewish faith that is essentially an unpardonable sin? Those are, those are good questions. So as it turns out, it's Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. Uh, the context is that uh, Jesus is, we are told, casting out demons. Throughout the gospel, Jesus is essentially doing miracles and the Jews are screaming, you know, why are you doing that? <laughs> Which of course makes completely rational Christians have an aversion towards Jews because they can't figure out why Jews are always getting in the way of stuff. Uh, so the Jews are saying, ah, he's casting out demons by the power of Satan, Beelzebub. Okay? So Jesus there, it's in that context that Jesus gives a number of reasons why that's not possible. That's ridiculous. So Mark has one point, and that is, you know, could a house be divided against itself? Could the devil um, cast out the devil? Because that's what Jesus is being accused of, being the devil. Matthew and Luke add to that a very interesting addition in that, hold on a moment, you Jews are casting out demons. Your rabbis are casting out demons. Your sons are casting out demons, depending on what translation you use. The point is, you're doing that too. So if devil is the one that makes that possible, then what does that say about you? I'm going to just do one thing. Is that I'm going to just, I actually have control of the ring central. I want to get rid of that. So what does that say about you? But I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. And there it, it illustrates that the writers of the Christian Bible, whoever they were, did not think that Jesus was God. Because in verse 32, it says explicitly that whoever will speak against the Son of Man, meaning whoever uh, commits the act of blasphemy against Jesus, so that sin can be uh, forgiven. Only the person who commits blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, only that act cannot be forgiven. Now, if Jesus was fully God and equal to the Holy Spirit and was begotten but not created, and he's co-eternal, very light of very light. You you hear me borrowing the language of the Nicene Creed. He is eternal God, equal to the Father and the Son. They are they have unique hypostatic entities, but they are in union of just separate persons using like the language of the church. I'm, I'm a little bit using that language because I want to show you how odd that language is, how unconventional that language is. No one uses it, and the church is able to hide behind it because it doesn't really make any sense. But the point is, if Jesus is equal to God and equal to the Holy Spirit, then why would blasphemy against the Son of God, meaning against Jesus, why would that not qualify as an unpardonable sin, but only against the Holy Spirit. Matthew's view, on the contrary, it's not only Matthew, but the view of the synoptics was that Jesus was not equal to the Father, and therefore, and not equal to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in classical Judaism is the is the dynamic movement and presence of God. Whatever that means, 
But the way we're able to encounter God is that we are creating the image of God and that enables us to be aware of God. No animal, no creature, no living creature on earth believes in God but mankind. And the way we're able to perceive the presence of God is through the Ruach HaKodesh, right? So that's God, it's his presence. And the word Ruach HaKodesh is really interesting because the word Ruach means spirit, and it also means wind, same word. Incidentally, in Greek, it's the same word as well. Why is that? Because you can't actually see the wind, right? You can't see the wind, it's air just moving around. It's not visible, but you could see the effect of the wind. You could see leaves blowing, so you know it's windy. When you look out the window and you want to know if it's a windy day, you see the tr trees moving. But the tree moving is not the wind itself. You are able to perceive the presence of the wind, the air moving, by its effect on the tree, see? So the spirit of Hashem is that effect of the presence of God that we're able to perceive. It's not a separate person, as in the doctrine of the Trinity, a distinct uh, hypostatic entity that's all later Christian invention. And, and that's important because whoever wrote the book of Matthew was operating under that understanding that the Holy Spirit is God. It's God's presence, and therefore it is distinct from Jesus, who in Matthew's view was not God, was not equal to the Father. And by the way, if, if Jesus is equal to the Father in the most modern, embellished iteration of Christianity, the doctrine of the Trinity, then why is Jesus the Son? Like, why isn't the Father the Son and the Son and the Father. I mean, the, the, when words mean everything, they mean nothing. I mean, very important uh, saying in the Jewish faith. The word means everything, then it just means nothing. Right? So the, what, why is Jesus the Son? Why is he the Father if they're co-eternal? Okay? So what's vital to understand is that what we, what we encounter in the Synoptic Gospels demonstrates that the authors did not believe in the Trinity. And that's why there is a different punishment for someone who commits an act of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit than against the Son. The Son, you will be forgiven. I'm making this up. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 32. It's not 22, it's 32. For the Son, you're forgiven. For the Holy Spirit, you're not forgiven. That's the unpardonable sin, okay? So you got that locked up. So that demonstrates they're not equal. And in fact, the doctrine of the Trinity is nowhere to be found in the Christian Bible with the exception of one passage, and that's in 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. And you'll only find that in, in translations like the King James Version, and you certainly will find it in Latin and Coptic translations, but that's a later interpolation, a later invention. On the contrary, the idea that the, the, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, they're all one, that was added in precisely because there was an absence of any mention of the doctrine of the Trinity. And without that passage, the doctrine of the Trinity can only be inferred. I discuss this extensively in volume one of Let's Get Biblical. And now to your other question is, is there an unpardonable sin in God's view, meaning in Judaism, because that's the faith that God has established for mankind and how to worship God. There is one sin that comes close to unpardonable. Now, there's a principle that a person can atone for any sin until a person dies. However, if someone commits an act of blasphemy against the name of Hashem, if someone utters the name of God, 
is an act of blasphemy. It means not any name of God, a specific name of God, which religious Jews will not pronounce. And when you encounter people who encourage you to pronounce it, don't listen to them. The Torah says in the Ten Commandments, I will not forgive you for that. If you utter the name of God in vain, that is unforgivable. I explain in another video, and, and maybe I'll just do it here. It's because it's like saying your parents' name. When you say the actual name of God, what you're doing is you're saying you're not my God. If a person is angry at God, and people are, it's like your parents. You can, you know, you know, my sisters are all great, so it doesn't work for me. Like, my sisters are like the greatest women that I know, like, really are. So it doesn't apply to me, but let's say you have a sister that screamed out, Mommy, I hate you. You're the worst mommy in the world, right? So that would be pretty bad, right? And maybe you heard your brother say something like that, you know, Dad, I hate you, right? And slamming the door. You might have heard that, right? But eventually you can make up. And you might not get involved in that thing. You might go, oh boy, you know, I hope they work that out, right? But if you heard your brother call your father David, you'd probably be shocked by that, right? You could, you're the worst daddy in the world, whatever. But if your brother said David, and your father's name is David. So what? that would shock you. That would shock you. Why? If your sister called your mother Sarah, you probably would be shocked. And you probably would say, you can't call mommy by her name. Why? You're the worst mommy in the world, maybe. By her name, that's too far. Why? Why don't kids typically cross that line? Because if you say you're the worst, so whatever, you, you, things are not working out right now. But the moment you, your sister calls your mother by her first name, what she is actually doing is she's saying, you're not my mother anymore. Okay? So no matter how angry you have been at your parents, Presumably, you never called your parents by their first name. You've never addressed them by their, their first name, right? So, and you're, you're probably wondering why. I've been angry at my parents, right? Well, the reason is because what you're then saying is that you're not my mother anymore. And that's what you're doing by uttering the name of God in vain, not other names. There are many names of God that we say in prayer that we say when we're reading from the scripture itself, but otherwise we would be reluctant to say that, certainly not an ordinary conversation. We don't do that. But in prayer, but there's one name of God, the Tetragrammaton, never say it. If people will try to convince you to say it, don't listen to them. I think it's a miracle that, Hash, that Hashem put it in the minds of those who change the Y for a J. And thank goodness, because it doesn't make sense, because, you know, there's a Y sound in English and Greek. So, like, why not? You know, wh wh how did that happen? And I think it might have happened. I think, I'm not sure, but it, it's quite possible Hashem did that in as a miracle to prevent um, non-Jews from doing something terrible. It's a, it acts as a barrier against that. Now, Maimonides discusses this, and ultimately any sin can be atoned for through repentance, but that would be the worst thing that you can do, is blaspheming the name of Hashem. But you would have to, don't do it. But you would have to use that name of God, not other names of God. That name of God is only reserved for, for the high priest and Yom Kippur. Otherwise, it's absolutely forbidden to say it. 
Um, and, and, and you're going, but in the Bible, it seems like people are saying it, but they're not. I'll just do this one thing, or else I only have 5,000 questions on this. If you go to Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, it says there that your forefathers, God is speaking to Moses, and he says, your forefathers, they knew El Shaddai, but they didn't know this name. They didn't know it. And you might go, what do you mean they didn't know it? It's all over the place, like Genesis 15, verse 8. Right? So it's very important to understand what that means. But it does not mean they were walking around using that name. And and what did Abraham mean? You have to understand, what do you mean they didn't know it? What does that mean to know? Right? Like, And I'm using Genesis 15 very deliberately when Abraham asks God, after being informed that his descendants will go into Egypt and be there for centuries as slaves before they come to the promised land, Abraham asks what seems to be an impossible question of how can I know? What do you mean, how can I know? You're Abraham. You don't believe? What is he asking for? So knowing is the experience. I know it doesn't seem that way on the level, but this is the problem of not speaking Hebrew. And that's why, incidentally, intimacy between a man and a woman is to know. He knew her. People think that's just an in, that's just a euphemism. It isn't. It means to experience. So the Hebrew language is tight, deep, sacred, 3D, hot. If you don't know it, when I say to you, if you don't, know the original Hebrew, and you're not using the original Hebrew when studying the Bible, and I say things like, you're kissing God through a towel, and you're going, oh, that sounds terrible. I, I'm i not overstating it because I'm really hyped up on getting you to study it. I'm, it's not hyperbole. You really are, it's all been just smoothed out. Moreover, translations understandably want their renditions, they want their translations to be very readable, right? But then you have to put it in a very readable style, like you know, like the NIV, it's very readable, or the, the Jewish publication, JPA. They want to make it very readable, but in order to make it readable, they have to really sacrifice. Because not only now you're not, not only now, are you translating from Hebrew to English, which you can't translate, it's a commentary, so not only are you doing that, but now you're changing the idioms completely so that it's pleasant to read, because Hebrew just reads very different. So it's all smoothed out, it's all shattered, it's all demolished. So to answer your question, going back to it, um, the, the unpardonable sin mentioned in the Synoptic Gospels illustrates that the evangelist who wrote those books, we don't know who wrote the Synoptic Gospels. No matter what people tell you, we don't know who wrote them. Okay, But whoever wrote them did not think Jesus was equal to God or the Holy Spirit, or what would be the difference. So it's very clear, Matthew 12, 32, they're not the same. Okay, And the worst thing you can do is commit an, an act of blasphemy against the name of God as we see in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, for example. Thank you for your question. Very good, very good. Okay, moving on. Can you hear me okay? My microphone sure. sounded like it kind of took a dip there. Okay, very good. We're going to move on to the next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, how are you? Good morning. Good morning. Um, what, a, what a blessing is to, to ask a question to Rabbi Singer. I have his book, and I'm fascinated with the book. Um, it answered a lot of questions I had. Now, I have a question about what, I mean, if, if Jesus, if he actually spoke most of the words that we hear, that, that, we, that we read in the New Testament, the so-called New Testament, he said to the Samaritan woman that the salvation is of the Jews, and that always resonated with me. That was actually one of the things that made me step away from everything, like everything and just walk more into the ways of the Jews. Um, he said that the salvation is of the Jews, 
And uh, he also said, well, that's that's what in the in the gospel says, that he um, um, he told the people that if if your if your sanctity or your holiness does not surpasses that of the um, Pharisees, you will not attain anything. And we know that the Pharisees were a high a high rank authority on those time of religious time. You know, today they the church view the Pharisees and they compare the Pharisees with the Jewish people, and mm-hmm. somehow it's just this attack. It's a constant attack, and like those verses are completely alienated from whom they want to portray Jesus is or what. So did he ever say anything positive? I see that that is positive to say that to the Samaritan women. You know, the salvation is of the Jews. Mm-hmm. And also to the people, like if, if your sanctity, your holiness does not surpass that of the Pharisees, so then you will not go in anywhere. You know, I, okay, I think that's that a great good, question. He ever that you. Thank you. That's very yeah. good. Question. Go, go ahead and hang up now. Cause that's really a great topic. And there's so much in there. We could go on. We literally could go on for an hour just having a fun conversation about it. So, uh, Rabbi, go ahead and take it away. That's a very, very sophisticated question very sophisticated i discussed this extensively in let's get biblical volume one in the section on the oral torah very sophisticated thank you so what we encounter it seems is um a schizophrenia in the new testament you mentioned the conversation between jesus and the samaritan woman in John chapter 4. So in John chapter 4, the Samaritan woman who recognizes that Jesus is the Christ, you know, and a prophet, a great person, um, which is typical in the New Testament, that the non-Jews, in the case of Samaritan, someone who thought they were Jewish, but they're not really Jewish. And at the time in the second century, excuse me, in the second temple period, they were the enemy of the Jews. They were the the fifth column in the land of Israel, highly problematic. So the Samaritans are good. You know, they're good. And by saying the Samaritan good and the Jews are not, like um, the it's like Luke ten and Luke seventeen in the parables there, it's it's really very toxic. I've talked about that in other shows. I'm not going to go there now. But what's very important is that in all the stories in the Gospels, the Jews are are portrayed or characterized as really despicable. In in any case, if you, if you pick up, though you've not read the Gospels, prepare yourself. It's worse than you think. Because all you're going to find is that the Jews are just are want to destroy everything that Jesus is doing and they want to do it for the stupidest reasons okay but here's the very important but the Jews have the truth as far as knowledge and this goes to both John chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 5 the sermon of the mount as far as what the Jews teach that is from God in the case of the Samaritan woman she asks Jesus, what is the holy place? What is, what, where is the center place for worship, right? So is it like my father, she's a Samaritan woman. Samaritans are not Jewish. They call themselves Jewish, but they consider Mount Gerizim to be their most holy place for worship. Is it the mountain like my father say, or is it Jerusalem? Is which is the holy place. I mean, there's a reason why the Samaritans don't like the prophets and the writings, because Jerusalem is really prominent, so they don't accept it, right? Because they don't accept Jerusalem as the holy place. So when, when Jesus replies to her and says to her, your fathers don't know what they're doing, and salvation is of the Jews, the context is that Jesus is replying to her that the Jews are correct on this. When it comes to knowledge, information, 
The Jews are right. If you want to know what to follow, what to believe, what they articulate to you is true. What they have is directly from Moses, Matthew 23, verses 1 and 2. They sit in the seat of Moses. That's how much authority they have. Being a Pharisee, believing in the written and oral Torah, is the standard, is the gold standard. And that's why it is claimed that all the Christians in the New Testament cup who, that are identified are identified as a Pharisaic background, not a Sadducee back. Sadducees were off because they rejected the oral Torah. They rejected life after death. They were just off completely. Mm-hmm. So never are the Sadducees regarded in any, there's nothing positive about them. But the Pharisees, they have the Torah Shabal Peh, they have the oral Torah. And in the, new, in the view of the New Testament, that was the gold standard. So Jesus is on one hand praising her for recognizing that he is the Christ. It's one of the few places in, in the Gospels where Jesus acknowledges that he's the Messiah. It's very rare. It's rare, I think, because Jesus never claimed that, and these stories will make it in. But very few stories get in where Jesus claims he is the Messiah. Like in, in Matthew 16, when Jesus says, who do you think I am? And that's at the end of the game. Nobody knows who he is. No one can figure it out except for Peter. And Jesus says, you know, flesh and blood couldn't have revealed this to you. What are you talking about? If you walked around saying that you're the Messiah which would be consistent with the Jewish view of this whole deal. So this all makes complete sense. If the Pharisees and scribes, which are interchangeable, and the the term Pharisee is just an anachronism. It means Orthodox Jews. So when you see Pharisee, it means Orthodox Jews. You can just replace it. Okay, It's It's an anachronism, even though very close to where I live in Jerusalem, there's a whole community that actually calls themselves Purushim. It, so I said it's anachronism, but there are people who use that term. It's unusual. Purushim means those who separate themselves. They don't integrate with the rest of the world. It's interesting, the, the community in Jerusalem that call themselves Purushim live in a small um Shuna, how do you say it in English? A a little neighborhood, good word. That looks like it's from the 19th century. Not kidding, not kidding. It's really, like, wow. Now, by the way, by Jerusalem standards, the 19th century is modern, right? But it's like, this really is 19th century. So it's 19th century. All right, so that's why in the Sermon of the Mount, Jesus is saying that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and scribes, because what, you know, then you can't enter the kingdom. You can't go to heaven. Why? Because what they're teaching is directly from God. What they're teaching is from God, not the Sadducees, but it's specifically the Pharisees. And that's why, for example, in Luke 11 and in Matthew 12, when Jesus accused by the Pharisees of casting out demons, devil, the, by an act of the devil, by using the devil, one of the arguments Jesus uses, we are told, his putative argument is that, but your own rabbis are doing that, your own brothers are doing that, your own sons are doing that. Whoa, whoa. So the New Testament is admitting that Jews, religious who are not Christians, were able to cast out demons. Okay, So let's get back. As far as the New Testament is concerned, the Jews are really bad people. And they're culpable for killing Jesus. And you have that in the speech and early on in the book of Mac, in the book of Acts. You have it really all over the place. They're always, they're hypocrites and vipers. That's the rest of Matthew 23. That's how Matthew, that's the dime on which Matthew 23 turns. That although what they teach you is true, they're hypocrites, they're vipers, they're the worst people in the world. Okay. And 
And so there's a distinction made in the Christian Bible between the knowledge of the Jews, which is correct, but the Jews are horrible people. They're blind. They can't see. And why they're blinded? Well, there are a number of reasons offered for this. So that's a very interesting question. It's exactly correct. The, the, the Samaritan woman is, a, is presented to us in John 4 as a, a, a terrific lady. Like she figures out that Jesus is a prophet. She figures out that he's the Messiah, right? So, you know, so she gets, a, from the, as far as the church goes, she gets a great check mark for that. And what she gets wrong is not, not, it's not really her fault. It's because her fathers don't know, see? So she's exonerated. She just doesn't know any better. But as far as knowledge goes, the Jews are right. Jerusalem is the center place of worship, not the mountain which is Mount Gerizim, where to this day, Samaritans, there are about a thousand, a thousand of them in Israel, not many, but they still go there to bring their offerings and famously their Passover lamb. Anyways, really great question. Thank you so much. All right, very good. We'll move on to the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Caller, you're live on the air. Hello? Yes, sir, you're live on the air. Yeah, yeah, this is Dwayne. I'm calling from here in Austin, Texas. Awesome. And I was just calling. Hello? Go ahead. Go ahead. You're live. Oh, okay. I was, I was just saying, I had experience when I was young. I was raised as a black Southern Baptist, and I went in the Army after going to the University of Texas, and, and, and I became a Muslim Orthodox and, and spoke some Arabic and prayed in Arabic and stuff. Then I joined the Nation of Islam, and then I left all that stuff because, like, I heard the rabbi say before, when you start actually reading the Bible, Christians, a lot of them become atheists. They, they, they become, you know, disbelievers and such. Because that contradictions you see from reading the books starts making you say, this is not the word. When you always told, this is the word of God, this is the word of God. And when you keep saying the Old Testament, you try to justify it. Because me and my friends, we read the Septuagint. And we say, okay, so that matches up better to what the guys in the New Testament are saying. But uh, I would always say, like, I'll, I'll ask you, why does it say that God, I said, if this is not, God is not good, that would give me commandments, that there's no way for me to obey, and they give me a punishment of death for breaking those commandments, and I had no way to follow those commandments in the first place. And then they would tell me that, that uh, basically I'm just saying is the Christian New Testament is schizophrenic, and you have a lot of people not using their brains to try to justify what they're reading in the book that doesn't make sense what's in the Old Testament. Like, there's no devil in the Old Testament. You read it, you can't find him. You see Satan, it doesn't say he's the devil. It just says he's the adversary, and he's one of the sons of God, an angel. So what yeah. would be... What, no, no, he's good. Keep <clears throat> I want to ask you this question. Keep him on, William. Yes, Do not touch that dial. Stay there for a moment, brother. This is amazing. You said something so interesting that I've got to I got to play with you on this. You said that you were a member of the Southern Baptist Convention and you're a black man. Do I have that right? Did I hear you correctly? Yeah, that's what I was raised in. Black either yeah, but, AME yeah, or, or yeah, we're Southern Baptist for the most part. Let, 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 let's check this out. Okay, so this is like insane. I'm so happy you're on. So the Southern Baptist Convention, what is that? So the Southern Baptist Convention was created in 1843 in Augusta, Georgia, because the Baptist church said that if you have slaves, you can't have a leadership role in the church, right? So the Southern Baptist church was created so that slavery can continue and you can be a leader. It means the whole Southern Bat, the whole SBC was created out of a crucible of racism and slavery. That was the whole point of the Southern Baptist Convention. And I, it blows my mind away. When I was in the United States, when I would drive past an SB, a Southern Baptist church and see black men and women going in, in their Sunday best, I go, why are you going in there? Like, why don't you just go to a Klan convention? And that's mind blowing to me. So that, you know, it's like interesting that you said that, that black men, that any person that does not endorse slavery, why, why would you go into a Southern Baptist church? I mean, that's another 
example right there of people who just don't even know what they're doing. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. yeah. Why would we vote Democrat? They were pro-slavery. They started the Klan. They lynched people. They had to be politicians. They had to be part of that. We do a lot of crazy things. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, like, so the Republican Democrat, I, I want to just play with this with you. So the Republican Democratic Party, you know, went through changes, right? But that's, you know, yeah. the way, but the Southern Baptist Convention, it was born in sin. That means it's raison d'etre. It had no other purpose. The only reason why the SBC, it's the largest Protestant denomination in America. The only reason why they were created is for one thing, and that is slavery. It's mind-blowing. And it, 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 what it's, first of all, I'm very grateful for you calling in. I'm, I really am. Very, very grateful. But it just goes to people are really not thinking, not because they don't want to think, they're just no one told them. No one ever yeah. said it to you, and it's. Um, I, I'm. I'm glad you. What's your first name again? Uh, Dwayne. And Dwayne. I mean, and really is because of the contradictions you will see from reading the 27 books in the New Testament. When you right. go back, even in the King James translation or whatever, and you read right. the Old Testament, and they don't match up, and then like I used to debate Christian guys when they would come to campus. And I would say, hey, dude, we're in college. We use the scientific method in, in physics class and things like that, biology. But yet we don't use it when we're reading this book. And, and, and a lot of things you say I didn't think about, but I used to always have doubt when I run into uh, contradictions in the Christian Christianity. Like I told the uh, screener guy, the host, that, um, um, look, why would God give us laws and then punish them? punish us and then give us a curse where we couldn't obey his laws, that that God is evil because right. he's murdering everybody. I'm talking about he is straight evil. He's not God is love like the Christians say in the New Testament. He just wants to kill you. And and, right. and, and I'm just saying is how do we get people, because I got three children. They were raised in the church and everything. Um, I want to know, because I send them clips of your videos and everything and debate. I just want to know how do we get people to think turn their brains on that God gave us to think and say, hey, this makes no sense. Why would we need a Messiah if God is the Savior? If God says he's one, why would he later say he's the Trinity? Why did they add on extra parts to these Gospels, which I knew before I even ran into you, that they added on extra uh, uh, chapters and extra words on these things so that they match up and fall in line? And, and I, just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to ask you, how can I speak to people all I do is give them your videos and give them clips so they can read for themselves. And right. I'm just going to say, what, what is it? When you uh, seek God with all your heart, you will find him. And I'm thinking, is that the only solution? These people actually have to want to seek God. No, 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 don't. don't. So here's, all right, first of all, Dwayne, thank you very much for your question. Really, it's a blessing. Go ahead and hang up now and tune yeah. in for the rest, okay? Yeah. Thank you, brother. Okay. So, so here's what we really don't want to do. We never want to ask God through prayer and meditation, what is your nature? That's Don't ever do that. No one should do that. And if someone says you should do that, run. Don't walk, run. Leave skid marks. Okay. The, the way we know the nature of God, the Lord who we worship, who our tongues praise, who our knees bow to, is only what it says in Tanakh, nothing else. Or else why do you need a Bible? What do you need to buy for anything? Why don't you just pray and say, Lord, reveal to me? The reason there's scripture is so that we should know who God is. And that he is one means he is love and mercy. He has to be love and mercy if he's one, if there's no trinity. He can forgive you. If that monotheism is injured, tampered with in any way, so then God can't forgive you if you repent. You need someone to die for your sins. You need some transaction to go down. So what's very important is the reason I write books and the reason I do these videos and the reason why I teach and I walk the streets of the land of Israel teaching people is I want to empower you. I want to show you the original I don't want you to depend on me. I am very grateful to you who comes over to me and says, you know, I really appreciate 
you know, you're teaching. I really am. Because sometimes I, I'm not into, it's electronic now, a lot of it, right? But the, what I want to do is I don't want the power. I want you to have the power. I want to empower you. Because I think it's enough. And I want to speak to the Christians in particular. It's It's been too long where you've been following a man. And I think it's important for you to follow the, the God of Israel. Do everything you can to reach the original read Hebrew and it's original. Very important. If not, you're just going to be taking somebody's word for it. And do you pray to Hashem for wisdom. For wisdom, you must pray for wisdom. In fact, the first thing you should pray for is wisdom. First, the first request is wisdom. If you don't have wisdom, if you don't possess wisdom, you won't even know what to pray for. You have to know what to ask for. So pray for wisdom and understanding. But never pray, what is your nature? Should I pray to Mary? Never do that. Never pray about what to believe. That's Tanakh. Don't go after your heart, It'll, your eyes. It, that's going to lead you astray. Okay? You pray for health. You pray for a marriage or a good marriage. You pray for your that your children would be raised up in the fear of Hashem. You you pray for your parents. You pray for Israel. You pray that the nations of the world might know and understand, and that the redemptive process should unfold. And you pray that you have the wisdom to know how to become a part of that redemptive process, that Hashem should only use me as a vessel for your redemption. But never pray about doctrine. And if somebody says, you know, you know, you should pray, whatever religion it is, like pray like what's the nature of God or who's the mis- never don't listen to people like that. They're gonna do that. And that's a sign that's the red flag of a false religion. The reason why we have a Torah and it's fixed and you can't add to it, nor can you take away from it, is because you can't pray about that. Never, 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 never. And now when you pray, you have to know how to pray. If you want children, you better read 1 Samuel chapter 2 and pray the way a prophetess prayed. Pray the way a prophet prayed in Daniel chapter 9. Pray the way a prophet prayed in 2 Kings chapter 18 and 19. Pray the way the great people prayed. Study the way they prayed. What were they doing? But I, I'm like so happy for you, Duane, that you called in because you talk about people who just accept stuff accept stuff do you know how outrage driving to newark airport i don't know how long ago this was driving to newark airport if you want to avoid if you want to avoid part of the garden state parkway where it intersects with interstate 78 because that's how you get to newark airport so you can drive through a town. I don't know. It's, I guess, in a Newark area. Okay. And there's a Southern Baptist church there. At least it used to be there years ago. Okay. And it's a way of bypassing the whole roundabout. You, you cut out time and you can cut out traffic. So and, and there's a Southern Baptist church there. And I've got to catch a flight on Sunday. And as I'm driving, there's the church. And it's a Sunday morning. And whatever, I've got to get to Newark, right? And I'm just driving, looking out, and, and I see women dressed to the nines, you know, in their Sunday best, going into a Southern Baptist church. And I'm going, I felt like just pulling over and saying, do you understand what you're going into? And the Southern Baptist church did not apologize for their history of slavery until I think it was 1990. That's a long time. That's a long time to apologize. They didn't apologize to us yet. 
Bailey Smith, the former president of the SBC, uh, had the the insight to say that God doesn't hear the prayers of a Jew. Mind blowing, like like Abraham. Like, God doesn't hear the prayers of a Jew. Are you insane? That they don't apologize for. But it took them. You see, what I'm not saying there are many organizations that um, that practice slavery. Many denominations did, but the SBC was created. Their the only the reason they were created, the re, only reason they were created, was because of slavery. That means that's what it is. It's a denomination made, forged out of slavery, forged out of sin. It's not the slavery in the Torah. That's a great institution. It gives people a home, a new life. This is slavery, which means a black man is not a full person. Dwayne is not a full person. That's evil and sin. The slavery in Georgia in the 19th century was pure evil, right? But the SBC was born out of that. That's that's why it came into being. It's not like it was, you know, it's not like the, you know, the Presbyterian Church wasn't created for slavery, but Presbyterian Church is practicing, but that's not why they were created. So that's mind blowing, really mind blowing. And I, and I so wanted to, I so wanted to walk over to a black man and say, what are you doing in that church? That place is a church that was built, created, forged out of slavery. That's the only reason it was created. Because the Baptist church at that period in the middle 19th century said, if you own slaves, you can't serve as a deacon. You can't serve as a pastor in a Baptist church. That wasn't all over the country. But that was the case in, in Georgia as an example. So they said, all right, well, heck with that. We'll just create our own denomination. That's what, what you call the Southern Baptist Convention. What does it mean, Southern Baptist? The SBC now is, is we are observing its destruction from within. But, and they also are at the forefront of Jewish evangelism. The Southern Baptist Convention, they team up with Jews for Jesus. They have their own messianic congregations. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. Could you imagine there are Southern Baptist messianic congregations, the same denomination that God said that the, its president, Bailey Smith, said God doesn't hear the prayers of a Jew. They are messianic congregations. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. That's how crazy this is. This is like information. And this is nothing I'm saying is, this is not conspiracy stuff. This is not Roswell. This is not any of that stuff. This is just simple history. Thank you for your question, Dwayne. God bless you. Very nice, very nice. All right, we'll move on to the next caller. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Caller, you're live on the air. They've been holding for a while. Yes, you're live on the air. Thank you for holding. Oh, oh my, my name is Michael. I'm from Temple, Texas. Welcome. Um, I converted back to Judaism. I was raised Catholic and then Pentecostal. And my mom claims that I can't become, I can't, I can't convert to Judaism because... I was baptized as a Catholic, and I, and by Judaism's own, uh, I guess, rules, I'm already condemned to hell because I turned my back on God. I, I don't right. understand it. It seems confusing. Okay, how what's, what's, what's your relationship like back? with your mom right now? She disowned me. My That's what I figured. That's what I feel, you know, because it's, it's, I'm really sorry about that loss, but obviously there was, and, and thank you for your call, that was a, a very destructive relationship. And at any point in your life, you can turn to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, renounce idolatry, turn to Hashem and say, Lord, I love you. I want to worship you alone. Never again will I worship any creature as God. I will never pray in front of a statue, never pray to Jesus, never pray to Mary, never pray to the saints. Walk, wash yourself and touch nothing unclean. And 
it, it, when you're the, and I apologize for asking you what your relationship like with your mother, but by her saying that to you at this stage means that obviously uh, there was something very destructive in your relationship, and that's why your response didn't surprise me at all. That's the one wonderful thing is Hashem will take you back. He loves you, adores you. Moreover, you were raised, as you said, in the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church, the Vatican, Rome, is there a darker place on earth? Rome? The seat of Rome? What could be more evil than Rome, than Edom? Nothing. But obviously, you've had a very dysfunctional relationship with your mom. And, and, and what a Christian could do is they could do two things. In order to keep you in the system, they can reason it through for you and explain to you why you should be a Catholic. Right. But there's, there's no godly reason for that. There's a godly reason to run away from the Roman Catholic Church. Or they can do what people do, and that is go, you're going to go to hell. And once you're baptized a Catholic, you're always a Catholic. Doesn't really make much sense. Doesn't even jive with, I mean, it's so ridiculous. I nearly said it doesn't jive with Hebrews chapter 6. And I'm going, <laughs> the whole Roman Catholic Church is, all right. So, um, yeah, so Hashem's love for you always will exceed your love for God. He will always love you more than you can ever love him, which very much means, what, what does that mean? This is not a thought experiment. What it conveys is that you, whose love for God will never be as great as God's love for you, determine the relationship. A relationship always takes on that of the lesser of the two. We, God's love for you is eternal, is infinite. So to the extent that we love Hashem, that characterizes the nature of our relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There are people at times who feel really bad about themselves and can't forgive themselves. That's what's happening sometimes. And people feel like, well, maybe God won't take me back because I've done some bad stuff in my life. My wife doesn't know. If she did, she'd throw me out. Well, God knows it. What's the point? Because God's ways are higher than your ways. The heavens are higher than the earth. That's how high God's thoughts are above your thoughts. Isaiah 55, verse 8, 9 and I skipped over verse 6 unintentionally, verse 6 and 7. Turn to God, he will forgive you. No blood, no cross, no Galgatha, no, no lamb, none of that stuff. Just turn back to Hashem. You see, all I want to do is empower you. Like, don't believe in Tovia, please don't. And if you're opening your Bible right now, and what your Bible says in Isaiah 55 for six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, if you don't fall in love, then nothing will make you fall. I mean, that's beautiful stuff. And then you go, whoa, this rabbi is just reciting what it says in the Bible. All right. So, um, so at any moment of your life, you can renounce the idolatry. Hashem is waiting for you. He loves you. You create in the image of God. He is your father and your only true father. He adores you and wants your home. And just turn to him. Return to him and he'll return to you. That's the message of Tanakh. It's, it, it, it's my arm is not too short to save you. It's, it's only because sometimes we're doing the wrong thing that, that acts as, as an impediment to our relationship with God, but God has nothing to do with it. If, if, so return back to Hashem. I'm really sorry about your relationship with your mom, the way she was speaking to you and was, was very, very dysfunctional. That's all I'll say. It's not important right now. 
what is important is to turn back to your true parent, your true father. He loves you. Thank you for your phone call. Beautiful, beautiful. All right, everybody. I'm going to take a, what time are we at? We still got plenty of time. Keller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Keller, you're live on the air. Is that me? You are. Yes. Who, who am I speaking with? Oh, fantastic. I'm James in Phoenix, fearfully confident on the chat. And you. William, you and I share the same birthday, my man. Oh, how about that? Happy and, birthday uh, to you, related. Very cool. Yeah, and you as well. My question is this. In Deuteronomy 12 and 13, when God says, do not add to, is that the New Testament? Or what is that exactly? And could Deuteronomy 13, where God says a false prophet should be put to death, is that Jesus' crucifixion? Mm. Or could it be? That's great. That's great. Well, what was the other one? The second? Deuteronomy uh, in, 13. Yes, it, where, where it says a false prophet should be put to death, it, it, could that be why Jesus was crucified? Okay. Good stuff. Really, Good stuff. It's you, you know what's really interesting about Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1, is that Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible is Deuteronomy 12, 32 in a Christian Bible. I'm not making that up. As I always say to my to my friends, look it up for yourself. So, right, so Deuteronomy 12, uh, 32 is about one possible message that a false prophet may convey, and that is um, don't add or take away from the Torah. So thank you for your question. So it's not an accident that the verse is cut differently because Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 is cut into the end of Deuteronomy 12 so that it's not connected to the false prophet or the seducer among you, which is the same thing. The seducer who is in your midst, whether he's doing miracles, showing you signs, don't follow him. What is the possible message? Two things. You don't have to keep the Torah, adding to the Torah, taking away from the Torah, or teaching you to follow God that your fathers didn't know. That's really important, Deuteronomy 13. It's not the only chapter. It's if your fathers didn't know it, then stay away from it. Because Hashem always preserves a remnant, always. So if your fathers didn't know about it, then it isn't true. So if your daddy is a religious Jew and he doesn't know about the doctrine of the Trinity, don't follow it. Right? It's 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 so it's baked in the system, the fail-safe system is baked in. It's so marvelous. It's so the fail-safe system, like how do you preserve doctrine? Like all Orthodox Jews, as far as doctrine goes, we believe the same thing. I mean, there are People who call themselves Orthodox but have gone off, you know, they're crazy people and everything. That's not important. But baked into the system is what your fathers knew. So, right, so Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32, is really Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. Deuteronomy 13, verse 1 begins by saying, if a prophet or dream dreams comes and says, let us follow other gods, right? Don't listen to him. If there's any tinge of you don't have to keep mitzvot anymore, stay away from that. And that's a core message of Paul. Romans 6, Romans anything, Galatians anything. You don't, completely antinomian, don't keep Torah. No matter what anyone tells you, that was the, that was the message of Paul. And he was disliked for it by fellow Christians. And in fact, almost all of Paul's letters, Paul is arguing with fellow Christians about this issue. And Paul won. And the Ebionite Nazarene, a very early iteration of Christianity, the Jerusalem church lost. Paul's view was adopted uh, can Deuteronomy 13 be speaking about 
the one who is your brother, verse 6, if your brother who is your, the son of your mother, very, very interesting, the son of your mother, why is that interesting? Because you see there, it doesn't say the son of your father, because you, you could only determine Jewishness by a matrilineal descent, right? So, you know, and then he says, what does he say to you? He, he says to you, foul serve other gods, whom your fathers have not known, right? Do not listen to that, pro don't listen to him, don't have murder, get rid of him. Now, is that Jesus? Don't know. Don't know what Jesus said. Don't know if the view expressed in Mark chapter 7 is a view that the historical Jesus would have expressed. I don't know. I know people like to ask me those kinds of questions. So it's, if Jesus did say that you don't have to keep the Torah anymore. Now, I know everyone's going Matthew 5, 17, the Sermon on the Mount. I didn't come to change the law of the law. What does that mean? Like, what exactly does that mean? Well, by according to 99% of Christians out there, that means that you don't have to keep the law anymore because Jesus will fold it for you. I'm not kidding. I'm, if you're not a Christian, you would not even know what I'm talking about. If you are a Christian, you go, well, actually, what Rabbi Singer is saying is true. There are some Christians that are pronomian that think that you actually have to keep the law, and they general, they often don't like Paul, or they have to reread Paul completely. They have to completely, they basically have to oppose Paul or just read something into it. So yeah, so very much is Deuteronomy 13 opposing Christianity, the message, follow other gods that your fathers didn't know, the doctrine of the Trinity. You don't have to keep the Torah anymore, Colossians 2, 16, 17, Romans 6, 7, it just, it's all over, Romans 7. Romans 7 is speaking to Jews. You don't have to keep the Torah anymore. I don't know if you got that. that if, you, if you're not knowledgeable about the New Testament, that's really significant because most of Paul's letters are addressing Gentiles. In most of Paul's writings, he's speaking to people who are not Jewish. Most, not all. But in Romans 7, he's very much addressing Jews who he's never met in Rome. So... Um, Right, if those things that are attributed to Jesus are really, I mean, did the historical Jesus really teach that kind of stuff? I don't know. I, I have no way of knowing that. Just logic would say, no, using a, a method like a very similitude, probably not. And that would be a later invention of Paul. And that would definitely make Paul the founder of Christianity. Definitely. So if what I suspect is correct, that that a historical Jesus would go, I don't know what you're talking about. I never claimed to be the Messiah. I never claimed to be God. I never claimed you should stop keeping mitzvot. What are you talking about? And that would be consistent with the Sermon of the Mount. Well, then very much Christianity is the religion of Paul, right? But because we, we don't have any non-Christian literature that's contemporaneous, we have nothing. So it's very hard to say. In Jewish tradition, certainly Jesus, Jesus was not teaching that you don't have to keep the mitzvot anymore. Um, but it, idolatry uh, it depends on what tradition. So there it becomes problematic. But yes, if... If Jesus taught that you don't have to keep the mitzvot anymore, if Jesus taught that he's God, wow. So that Deuteronomy chapter 13 is directly addressing Jesus and everyone like him. Thank you for that thoughtful question. Very nice. Like, like, like. Do you like me? We like you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're live on the air. Please tell, tell you, us. You've got really nice hair. I really like it. <laughs> Whose hair? Your hair, Rabbi. <laughs> This oh, goes yeah. without saying. This is not. A, <laughs> yeah. What are you, Christopher Columbus? Of course, right? like, man, he blessed me with some long eyelashes. 
<laughs> I really don't like being patted on the back ever. That's funny. Yeah. My ex-wife used to keep me down that way. Oh boy! Yeah. Like I'm later. <laughs> well, welcome to the show. What is uh? What, what's what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah. What? Don't don't. I'm not live or anything. Yes, uh, you're live on you the are. air. You're really live. You really live. Dang it! Why? Not, <laughs> yeah, no. I know. This is gonna this is gonna hurt, hurt your career a bit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> career. You, you I mean, just, <laughs> The, these are your 15 me. minutes of fame. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, oh. So what's your name? All right. I got to go get bagels with my boy. I what, really do. What's your, what's your name first? And then tell us your question, and I'll let you go. My name, what questions do I have? What questions do you have? Really? Hmm. Okay. All right, great question. Thank you. They get questions. All right, bye. <laughs> bye, <laughs> Later, guys. That was funny. I'll call you live on the air. Uh, Call you live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where you calling from? Uh, this is uh, David in Austin. Good. Welcome, David. How are you today? Doing good. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. What's uh, what's the question for everybody today? Um, got a difficult question. Um, about uh, I. By the way, I love your show. I love you guys. Thank you. Um, I got got a question about uh, Psalm one thirty seven nine. It says uh. Yeah, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks. Yeah, it's real tough for Psalm 137.9? Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so you just want... Oh, oh re- reason, a reason I asked that is because I, I saw some atheists talking about how um, that was a reason why Judaism supports um, uh, human sacrifice, supposedly. Okay, All right. so go ahead and hang up now. Tune in for answer. Thank you for your call. All right, everybody. All right, so this is a very, very famous psalm, and it's a psalm where people are lamenting over the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the first temple. Imagine Jewish people in Bovell. So it, it would be... We have to do an equivalent. In in Babylon, after Babylon had just eviscerated the Jewish people, murdered so many, Ezra's father among them, and now they're in they're in, in Babylon. They're lamenting the loss of Jerusalem. And I've heard people ask me this question about one thirty seven verse nine. Like somehow this is a commandment to take little children. Babylonian children and smash their heads into a rock. I've heard people who actually have high level doctorates in some area of theology repeat that. I I think just people are, are ignorant of the text. So that part of the passage, that part of the Psalm, that part of the chapter is the lament. This is what people are going to scream. Isn't that like God saying, thou shalt? It's um, it's Jews after World War II and going, to hell with you Germans. May your children die the fate that our children, may you, you go through the hell that you put us through. So this is not like one of the Ten Commandments, like kill Babylonian children. It's the excruciating scream of those who had just suffered the destruction of their families, their community, their temple, their lives by the Vuchadnetza Hiroshi, by the king of Babylon. That's the whole context. So it's it's not like thou shalt kill Babylonian infants. It's what will the screams be? What will the Jews say? I rem- I was born 15 years after the Holocaust. I know what Jews said about the Germans. I I know what survivors said about those who destroyed European Jewry. And it wasn't just I'm not going to buy a Mercedes or a Volvo. Excuse me, a Volkswagen. It wasn't, it wasn't just, I'm not going to buy a German product. It's, 
may you endure the hell that you put us through. That was an extemporaneous feeling. That was around me. I don't know if people said that about the Japanese, but Jews definitely said that about the Germans. And Jews said that about the Babylonians. May you go through the hell like our children's heads were smashed open and the people we love were killed. I hope you go through that too. So it's there. It is a a very powerful way. Of, it's not even a parable. It's it's it, an extemporaneous expression of rage towards those who destroyed the temple against Babylon. And I always tell people the whole chapter is what nine verses. Just read it in context. It's not complicated. And when your atheist professor quotes that. You know, call them to task on it. There's no, it's not a commandment. It's what people who survived Babylon, who survived Germany, who survived Rome said, the hell with you. May it, the same thing happen to your kids. See how you feel. Curse on you. You go through the hell that you put us through. Thank you for your question. Okay, moving on to the next caller. One second here, trying to deal with other messages as well. Okay, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where you're calling from? Hello, can you hear me? I can, loud and clear. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Chris from Albuquerque. Chris, New welcome. Mexico. Very good. Uh, my question was: You were speaking about the name of God earlier, mm-hmm. given to Moses. My right. question was, uh, why wasn't this God, uh, name of God given to Abraham? Thank you. That's a good question. Right. Thank you for your call. Good name, now to answer. Go ahead, Abraham. Right. right. Okay. All right. So this is a very deep question. So this is definitely the last question. No problem at all. Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. That's where we find the combination to the lock. Um, the the deliverance of the children of Israel is being assured. God is conveying this. The era el Avram el Yitzchak el Yaakov be'el Shaddai. I appear to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as the name El Shaddai. I'm using that normally. If it was ordinary conversation, I'm not quoting from scripture, I would say Kel Shakai, we don't, but now it's very important. Ushmi Hashem, this is the ineffable name of God, Loi Nodati Lohem. However, the name Yudke Vavke, Loi Nodati Lohem means was not known to them, was not known to them. Problem. They knew the name. So if the word know means, they just, I didn't know, right? If that's what the word know means here, then this makes no sense at all, okay? So the word know, as we find very often in the Bible, means something else, then it all makes sense. If the word no, which is das, dalad ayin is the root, dea, knowledge. If the word knowledge, this is very deep, and we're going, if you understand what I'm about to say, we're gonna go, you're, you're not gonna be quite the same person. If the word no does not mean I didn't know that the sky is blue or why it's blue, but it means something else, that I didn't experience it. it. So then, then it takes, takes on, on a whole, whole different, different meaning. meaning. So, so I, I want to now turn to a passage that is very important in Genesis, Genesis chapter 15, 15 verse 8. eight. Abraham is being brought by Yomar, the Lord God, Bemor Eda Ki Iroshenu. 
So, so Abraham is saying, how will I know, by what means shall I know, that I will inherit it? The context, God has just promised Abraham he's going to inherit these things, and not through Eliezer, but through his own child. What do you mean, how can I know? God told you. Okay. So what I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm making a fantastic claim, but as you can see, this is naked. The word know here does not mean no as I don't have the information or I don't believe you. Oh, wow. It, it must mean something else, something really holy, something really deep, powerful, going deep. What was Abraham? Abraham was like the greatest person who ever lived, along with the greatest prophets. I mean, Abraham was, God said, God said of Abraham, you're my friend, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8 and 9. Friend, no one else is called God's friend. No one. Zero people besides. So Abraham is on a completely unique level. Abraham knew that God was God in that name. What is he asking for? He's going, let's say, how I know. Well, God just told you. You're like the greatest person that ever lived. When Abraham came to know about the God, about God, he was the first. He was the greatest person that had ever lived, ever lived. So he wasn't asking like, "How will I know?" I like, you would ask, friend, like, "How do I know I can trust you?" What do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? If the word "dust" to know means experience it, because what God said is, "This is going to happen. You're going to be long dead. Abram will have died." many, many years before the exodus, before even the going into Egypt. So like God is telling the future, and Abraham is, what he is saying is, how can I experience it? No, doesn't mean like knowledge, but it's like knowing your wife, like experiencing it. I'm not going to be alive. So then Hashem makes with Abraham uh, the Brisbane Habasarim, the covenant between the parts, and the, the light moves through. So Abraham, in his vision, experiences an exodus, a salvation. He endures it. So the word no here means something completely different than what is conventional. And then everything makes sense. Abraham knew God as El Shaddai. What does that mean? What did he know, and what is Yud K Vav K, the Tetragrammaton, the Shem Hashem? What didn't he know? So it's not knowledge. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the word "no," even though your translation will put "no" in there, and we're going to extract it, and in its stead, we're going to replace it with experience. Abraham did not experience the Exodus. He didn't endure it. He died before the Jews went down there, were taken down there to Egypt when the 70 souls, Exodus chapter 1, verse 5. Long before that. So if it once, this is what we do. You see, what's it's like just a perfect, you know, spiritual... Um, algorithm equation it's just perfect it's like math that's why i like math because it all works so once we insert remove the word no which is conventional and put in the word experience so everyone's going how can i experience it oh god says okay we're going to do an exodus experience for you and that's exactly what follows in genesis chapter 15. And then we know exactly what's going on in, Gen in exodus chapter 6 verse 3. what is it that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob knew that was El Shaddai. What does that mean, El Shaddai? Again, don't use those words. I'm doing it now because I don't want anyone to worship idolatry. El means power. They experience the power of God. Shaddai. I don't want to get too complicated, and it's not easy to, but Shaddai is the one who was instrumental in the creation process and said, stop. 
God halted the creation process when the sixth day came to an end and the seventh day began. Why is that important? Well, you'd have to answer a different question. Why did God rest on the seventh day? Was he tired? Did he need a vacation? And for whatever reason, you will attach to the reason why God rested on the seventh day. He did no work. And the Jews are commanded not to do any work on the seventh day. The question is, why are we celebrating that day? Why is that holy? It should be the six days where God is creating stuff we should be celebrating. God is creating. Whoa, day one, creating light. Whoa, day two, day four, sun and the moon. Another sun. No. No, you're we're celebrating a day that God didn't do a thing. Why? Why are we doing that? So you understand all the problems? Once you understand, once you're kissing Tyra, once you're drinking Tyra, once you're eating, once it comes, you, it becomes infused in you, you become a new creation, really new creation. So it's very deep, very hot, tight. And people should have been asking this question before. Like, don't blame this on me. How come I didn't know this? You should have asked it. Stay with me. When God created the world, he, Everything he created became a mess where God is hiding behind it. Every step of creation, light, had to be first. We know now why. We know from a discovery in the early 20th century, light and time. Without light, no time. God is hiding behind his creation. People think they can look at the rocks and the, and the celestial bodies and figure out that there is no God. And in fact, there was such a person who made the claim, we don't need God anymore. You know, there was a physicist who, there are physicists, we don't need God anymore. We, we can work our way around God. All right, so what's happening is God's creation can be the source for our discovery of God in the creation, or it could be a way for us to deny God and say, oh, God there, it's all... Big Bang, and it just happened, and it started, and we're not sure exactly what happened in that first moment, but one day I'm sure we'll figure that out and where consciousness comes from. Well, those are the, those are the two big things. Okay, so, so when God stopped the creation process, he said, die, enough. What he did was he prevented any creation from going further, because if creation is hiding God's identity, potentially, then if he would have created any further, he would have worked on the seventh day, we wouldn't be able to find him. Our free will would be injured. So die, enough. So the name Shaddai really means the one who said to the world, stop. And therefore we celebrate. What are we celebrating on Shabbos? On Shabbos, we're saying, I found you. You stop the creation process at the end of day six, and Shabbos is a day of menucha, it's a day of rest, it's a day of recognizing that Hashem is the creator of the heavens and the earth. That means that we made it. If, if, if the sixth day would have bled into the seventh day, if any creativity would have gone on, we wouldn't be able to find it. So Shabbos is a day completely devoted to recognizing that Kajibah was this is so if you understood me, you're on a different level right now. Okay? So now we know what is packed, what is baked into these names of God. The Hebrew Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob know El? Yes. El means power. Shaddai, yes, they discovered God. They achieved that the person who turns his back on Shabbat is the person who denies God. person who doesn't keep Shabbat denies God. Jews are commanded to do that, but everyone should understand what the significance is. Why are we resting? Because the day that we stop creating anything, no creation, we don't cause, we don't create a combustion in our engines on Shabbat. No. Why? Because I found you, Hashem. That's why Shabbos is so critical. If a person denies Shabbos, a person denies God. Because you are then fell into that I'm into creation. And we see it today. We see today where we have people who are these physicists who, who specifically are the big atheists. And what, are the, what is their argument? 
Their argument is that we can see, we can, we can work out, we can map out almost everything through physics. We don't need God. Ah, but you got the problem. How did it all start? Like what happened a moment? Well, we haven't figured that one out. Well, yeah, well, that's the one that matters. Not the transitional parts of where we went from that. It's all about ex nihilo, that God created something from nothing. That's everything. <sighs> Isn't that good? Now we understand everything. When, when God said in Exodus 6, 3, in his conversation with Moses, that you are going to know yud K vav K, what is the name of God that we don't pronounce, is the God was, is, and will be. You're going to experience the Exodus. Who is God addressing? Moses. Who is God speaking about? His people whom he will lead through the process that was promised to Abraham, but he never witnessed it. So Moses and his generation knew yud K vav K, which doesn't mean no, which means experienced yud K vav K, experienced the prophecy that was given hundreds of years earlier to Abraham. Mind-blowing. You know the shame Hashem. What is no? It doesn't mean you know the name. That's what we think it means. As I've demonstrated to you, that it definitely is not what it means. What it means, Yud K Vav K, is forever, past, present, and future. And Abraham wasn't saying, How will I know that I'll inherit you? Abraham, that would have been a minor trust issue. Abraham is going to be ready to sacrifice his son in seven chapters later. Abraham did not have a problem of trusting God. Abraham wanted to experience the exodus, but he couldn't because he wouldn't live long enough. He'd just been told it's not, he's not going to live long enough. He said, can I experience this covenant? So God made a, a, a miniature or a special unique covenant for Abraham, the Brisbane Absurdum, the, the, the covenant between the parts of the animals that are cut in part and the torch passes through it and that's the vision that's why it all is so yummy so right you're gonna know your cave of k which means know the exodus what did i tell you no means experience the exodus something that abraham isaac and jacob did not experience and now you can give hashem a very very big kiss thank you hashem i love you very much now you can go and study lush and Kodesh, the hebrew Biblical Hebrew is so easy. You want to be close to Hashem, it's the only way. No other way, my friends. It's so, it's so yummy, so delicious, but you have to understand these things. And the translation ain't going to give it to you. Thank you for that question. Shalom. Shalom, and that is a wrap, apparently. So thank you all for tuning in. Rabbi, thank you for your time, and we look forward to seeing you not the same time, same place next week. I think we're going to do it uh, Next week? No, Monday. next week we're same time, same place. I thought we were going to do it Monday next week instead of Sunday. No, it's in two weeks. Oh, in That's two weeks. on the 20th. Yeah, so we're good in two weeks. Perfect. Okay, very good. All right, well, we'll see you all soon. Rabbi, thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it, and we'll see you guys on the other side. Shalom, everybody. Peace. friends hope this message finds you well if you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you please consider supporting the channel by going to the website tanakhtalk.com t-a-n-a-c-h-t-a-l-k.com thank you once again for your time and for supporting tanakhtalk shalom